Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, trade progress. President Trump reiterates he may extend a tariff truce with China and take steps to sell a potential deal to opposition lawmakers. Plus, tough break. Uber's losses continued through the fourth quarter of last year as sales are slowing. What does this mean as the ride-hailing giant preps for its IPO? And Bezos fails on New York. The fallout from Amazon scrapping its HQ2 plans. We will hear from lawmakers and CEOs about how this could change how all companies do business with government officials. But first to our top story, U.S.-China trade talks will continue next week in Washington. Two days of high-level talks in Beijing this week have wrapped, with Chinese President Xi Jinping saying negotiations between both sides have achieved important progress. President Trump was positive about some kind of a deal earlier Friday from the White House. Tariffs are hurting China very badly. They don't want them, and frankly, if we could make the deal, it'd be my honor to remove them. But otherwise, we're having many billions of dollars pouring into our treasury. We've never had that before with China. It's been very much of a one-way street. The U.S. is scheduled to raise import taxes on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods March 2nd if the world's two biggest economies can't resolve their differences. Sarah McGregor covers U.S. economic policy for Bloomberg. She joins us now from Washington. So, Sarah, what do we know about what kind of progress was made? Well, that's a great question, because we do keep hearing from the Trump administration, from Chinese President Xi Jinping's government, that the sides are making progress. After every round of talks, we've heard this, this line, but really, we haven't been presented with much evidence yet of what that progress is. You know, we're fairly certain that China's agreed to buy more soybeans and energy products, um, you know, maybe make some small tweaks to, uh, to some policies, but really, these large-scale, deep structural reforms, addressing intellectual property theft, removing state subsidies, we're, it's really a black box. We don't know if China's, um, you know, budging on these issues. And it's sort of, uh, it's hard to believe that it would, such a large-scale overhaul to its economy that it would agree to. So right now, you know, we're really just basically led to believe that there's a lot, a lot more work to be done on these core issues. How else could this escalate? So, um, again, we're looking ahead to this March 1st deadline, and, of course, Trump even repeated today there might be some wiggle room there. We reported earlier this week that the uh, White House is considering a 60-day extension. That would take us into, you know, about late uh, April or so. And so, you know, there is there seems to be a... Um, a little room here for, for a deal still to be made. How this could escalate would definitely be the Trump administration levying more tariffs on China. China has retaliated every time a set of tariffs have been imposed on them by the Trump administration. And, you know, there's every reason to believe right now they would do the same. And if the Trump administration starts hitting more Chinese goods, that's going to hit things like your laptops and your computers and your TVs and your toys, the things that consumers really, um, you know, really want here in the U.S. And so um, that would have a much broader impact on the economy and also perhaps Trump's popularity. Enforcement, IP protection, technology, all of these are sticking points. How might those progress? Well, that's the million-dollar question. You know, China has, during the course of these talks in the past few months, announced tweaks to some of its policies. A lot of people might say it was things they already had in the hopper or are sort of small changes, changes that could take years for them to implement and might not make a difference unless they, you know, they uphold them in their courts and by their police forces. And so, um, you know, if really, if the Trump administration sort of willing to take those type of promises and, and go with them, they might be able to make a deal. But I think there's a lot of doubt whether this over, complete overhaul of the economy, basically, in China will really be something that can be achieved, whether it be by March 1st or, or the, you know, another 60 days tacked onto it. Now, earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal reported that China is considering an additional $200 billion in U.S. chip sales to China. How does this fit in? So, of course, purchases are, um, you know, they are a piece of the puzzle, of course. The, Donald Trump has ra sort of railed against this trade deficit. And obviously, the U.S., you know, tech would be a big, um, a, a big win for them in this. I think if you, you know, if you buy soybeans, if you buy f some more manufactured goods, sure, that's, that is, those are products that are from some key Trump support bases, at least politically, and they're important products for America. But when you start to look at the high-tech piece of the puzzle, that's potentially more lucrative for the U.S., 
But I do think, again, it sort of is only one piece of the puzzle. And these key IP issues, this economic overhaul of China's economy, that's what Trump has promised to deliver. And anything less than that, whether it's purchases of, of um, chips or soybeans, is, is going to be, um, is going to fall flat. All right, Bloomberg Sarah McGregor for us in Washington. Sarah, thank you so much for that update. Of course, we'll continue to follow the talks next week. Well, Uber reported fourth quarter financials Friday, showing slowing growth and continued losses, results that could cast a shadow over the ride-hailing giant's IPO plans. Meantime, the company's regulatory battles with New York City are heating up. Uber announced it is suing the city over its cap on four higher delivery and transportation vehicles. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer in New York. Eric, what is the significance of this suit? You know, Uber's playing it hot and cold with the city. One second, you know, it's Lyft and Juno that are suing over uh, the minimum payment requirements and Uber's sort of sitting on the sidelines. And now Uber's trying to fight back on the caps, which limit how many drivers it can have out on the streets. So, you know, I think it's sort of seizing a moment where Amazon has just uh, left New York and there's it's sort of a Friday afternoon and announcing that it's going back to war with the city after a brief cooling off period. What does that mean then for longer term plans in New York City? I mean, of course, it's been sort of many years, as you say, of this back and forth. You know, I, I think it's trying to sort of walk a fine line here where it's, you know, it, this isn't a scorched earth suit. It's clearly something that Uber's felt strongly about, uh, has been pushing, Uber's been pushing for congestion pricing sort of as the focus instead of a hard cap. And, you know, it's not going to win over the mayor's office, which has pretty much had a sort of a hostile relationship with the company. They, they don't have a very good working relationship. So I think the idea is we're not going to win over the mayor. We can fight them in court. Now, talk to us about these financials. Losses down 15 percent for the full year, but still $1.8 billion. Yeah, there, there are lots of ways to slice these losses. I mean, if you look at the gap figures, the adjusted figure, which is the $1.8 billion. But, you know, the takeaway is that losses continue and revenue growth is slowing. And that's certainly a concern for Uber. And I think the issue here is just competition has continued. I think at every turn, Uber sort of hoped that there, there would be a moment where there would be less competition and so it would be able to extract more profits. That hasn't happened. It's faced competition in Latin America. Lyft is, remains competitive in the United States. And that means that the cut of its top line, the gross bookings, is going down. It's harder for it to turn that money into revenue, which then translates to a challenge bottom line. And so it's competition that's that's hurting Uber's business and there's no sign of it abating. Is this going to impact their IPO process? Will it deter investors? You know, I, I think investors have a long time horizon here. They see all the areas where Uber is expanding. You talk about food delivery with Uber Eats. You talk about sort of logistics with freight. You talk about scooters and electric bikes. So Uber has done a good job of saying there's a bigger story here and we're going to change transportation dramatically. And, you know, to date, that's been a message that investors have been enthusiastic about. And so, you know, if that rationalizes with the public markets with a focus on the path to profitability, I mean, that would be certainly a change of pace and is possible and something I'm very eager to see, you know, how the transition from sort of bullish private market investors to more skeptical uh, public investors plays out. Meantime, the Didi story in China has been evolving in very disturbing ways. Uh, two women passengers were allegedly murdered by drivers. Now the company is cutting 15 percent of the workforce or, or 2,000 jobs. Tell us more about what you know here. Yeah, the China market has been challenged. I mean, talking about Uber, it, it sort of in retrospect feels smart that they stepped away, sold their China business to Didi. And then after they did, you know, Didi faced a lot of competition from Meituan and then sort of much more scrutiny from the government about the quality of the drivers and from the public in China, honestly, about the safety there. And I think that's all coming home to roost and it has really po posed a challenge for Didi's business because safety right. is at the core of what these companies do. And if they can't assure the public and regulators about that, you know, there are going to be all sorts of challenges 
going forward. Absolutely, this on the back of explosive growth uh, leading up to this. Okay, Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer, thank you so much thank you. for weighing in. Coming up, Facebook attempting to avoid being hit with billion dollars in fines from a U.S. regulator. We'll look at how the company is working with the FTC. That is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Facebook is negotiating with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission over a potential multi-billion dollar fine. The talks are over claims that Facebook violated a 2011 privacy consent decree. At the time, Facebook promised it would implement a set of data protection initiatives. But in December, the FTC said it had evidence that Facebook had violated the agreement. To discuss, we are joined by Bloomberg's antitrust reporter David McLaughlin in Washington and in Philadelphia. We've got Scott Vernick, a partner at Fox Rothschild. He's also the chair of the company's privacy and data security practice group. So, uh, David, this pertains to the Cambridge Analytica situation, which impacted 87 million users. What do we know about the negotiations between Facebook and the FTC? Uh, well, the, the information that, uh, at this point is, is pretty preliminary, but, but what we know is that uh, the two sides um, are talking. Facebook um, uh, is, is cooperating with the agency, answering lots of questions um, about, the, about the Cambridge Analytic issue. Um, and the, the way this looks like to be going is that this, this could be a settlement potentially that is many billions of dollars. Um, Bloomberg wasn't able to confirm that there's been an actual number you know, put on the table or that both sides are discussing, discussing an actual number um, for a fine. Uh, but that sort of looks like where this is going. Um, I think the other big question, though, for Facebook uh, and the FTC uh, besides the money will be like, you know, the conditions that fi that the FTC might put on Facebook um, as part of any settlement, conditions on, on how Facebook conducts its business. Now, Scott, the FTC is entitled to fine as much as $41,000 per violation. We're talking about 87 million users here, which is, if you multiply just those two numbers, is far more than just a couple billion dollars. Is this fine enough if it's in that range? Uh, look, uh, if you just do the math uh, the way you explained it, you're talking about a mega billion fine. I don't think it'll get there. I think that, uh, and, and no, no proposal has been put before uh, the commission yet, let alone the five commissioners. So it's a little bit early days to try to figure out, um, figure out what the size of that fine is. But look, the FTC is under pressure to demonstrate that it's got bite, not just bark. Um, and I think that will figure into what's happening here. I do expect the fine to be with a B, um, but I don't think it'll be as, as, I don't think it'll be set at the maximum that the law allows, which is 41,000 per uh, violation. But it'll be far more than the biggest fine to date, which is about 22 and a half uh, that the FTC file, uh, fined against Google in 2012. Right, which certainly doesn't even compare to a, a, a number in the billion dollar range. But if the FTC needs right. to prove that it has a real bite, why negotiate at all? Well, I think the reason to negotiate is, first of all, um, if you don't negotiate and you simply take it to court, um, I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk for the FTC that they're going to win and that they're going to be able to prove violations um, of the consent decree. Remember, the FTC only gets to fine here because there's been a violation of a consent decree. I think there's some gray areas in the consent decree about whether and under what circumstances uh, Facebook actually got consent from users in the case of uh, Cambridge Analytica or in other cases or in other situations that the FTC may be reviewing. So going to court isn't necessarily a slam dunk. It's a long, drawn-out battle. I think they would prefer, and Facebook itself might prefer, to actually reach, reach a negotiated resolution. So I think that I think they will probably get to a number. But I think, as David pointed out, the real issue, or at least just as important issue, is exactly what is what are the other stipulations 
uh, and requirements that are going to be part of this order uh, and how long will Facebook uh, be bound by them. And I think that that's an equally uh, important part of the remedy here. Right. So, David, could Facebook actually be forced to change its business practices as a result of whatever is decided here? Uh, yes, potentially, and, uh, and that's certainly what uh, many privacy advocates uh, want to see. They don't, they're, they're not going to be just satisfied with a, with a big fine, and they point to the, the old settlement in 2011 that got us to the situation. They point to that and they say, look, the FTC put a lot of conditions on uh, what information Facebook was collecting um, from users, and it wasn't enforced and it didn't work. So this this time around, we need to be, or the FTC needs to be, needs to be much much tougher. And there's a lot of pressure on the FTC at this time, not just from privacy advocates, but also from from Capitol Hill. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of the agency that they've been sort of asleep at the switch, uh, fair or not. But uh, that's the criticism, and then. The, this is a moment when there could be privacy legislation passed this year. Plenty of people think that this uh, enforcement power should just be taken away from the FTC. So the chairman is really under the gun to do something pretty big. Now, Scott, what exactly did Facebook do wrong in the Cambridge Analytica situation? And how much does it differ from every other Facebook scandal that seems to have broken <laughs> on a weekly basis for the last year? I mean, Facebook <laughs> is challenged weekly by the press, by multiple investigations. Is what happened in Cambridge Analytica so much more egregious than all of these other things, or should the FTC be investigating a lot more? Well, I, there, there are certainly other things for the FTC to, to investigate. But remember that Cambridge Analytica is not a classic data breach, right? It's not a situation in which there was an infiltration by a threat actor and they breached Facebook and they got a whole bunch of personal information. That came later, actually, as Facebook itself announced. But what's at issue in Cambridge Analytica is the sharing of information with a third party, namely Cambridge Analytica, and not fully appreciating exactly what that gave Cambridge Analytica to, or, uh, or rights to, or access to. And so what Cambridge, the, I think the issue for the FTC is whether or not Facebook fully realized that by having Facebook users download the Cambridge Analytica app and use it and answer questions, that at the same time, whoever answered the questionnaire was actually getting, giving access to information from their friends as well. And so, you know, there's a, the, the real issue is, is that they either, uh, did they know exactly what Cambridge Analytica was getting access to? Did they fail to police? Um, were they tight enough in terms of sort of monitoring, you know, their contractual policies and sharing information with third parties? I think that's what makes it so different is because, you know, people had no idea, oh, if I download this app and answer this questionnaire, I'm giving access right. to my friend's information. And I think that's what makes it sort of particularly, um, uh, you know, I think that's what makes it sort of p particularly stand out as an issue because, I don't think, you know, a data breach is a data breach. That's troublesome in and of itself. Uh, right, not having right. control over your information because you're using apps, you know, is, takes it to a different uh, position, I think. Uh, Scott, we'll have to leave it there. Of course, this is the data that ended up in the hands of the Trump campaign. Of course, we'll continue to track what happens here between Facebook and the FTC. Scott Vernick of Fox Rothschild and our own David McLaughlin. Thank you both. Coming up. Amazon backs out of New York City. What we know about why negotiations fell apart. This is Bloomberg. Breaking news, Amazon canceling plans to build a second headquarters in New York City. The tech giant faced major backlash after the city in New York State promised it nearly $3 billion in financial incentives. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio slammed Jeff Bezos as a 1% elitist whose company victimized poor New Yorkers by ending its HQ2 plans for the city with an out-of-the-blue phone call, quote-unquote. One analyst, however, isn't convinced that Amazon is scrapping its plans to operate a second headquarters in New York City, calling it a bluff. Tom Forte of DA Davidson is convinced the announcement may serve as a means to get the government back to the table. What? To discuss all things Amazon, I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech Spencer Soper in Seattle. So, Spencer, is there any chance that Amazon is going to come back to the table in New York? 
Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting theory, and and who who knows? But I guess the the main point of a of a theory like that is, you know, there's nothing preventing Amazon from simply just growing its existing presence in New York anyway, without all the pomp and circumstance around a, a second headquarters search and tax breaks and all that kind of thing. Just think about how Google kind of came out of nowhere and, and bought an entire city block. So, uh, you know, there, there could be some truth to that theory, even if we don't see some kind of renegotiation going on, just simply that Amazon could continue to grow its operations in New York. So what do we know about how negotiations fell apart? Do we have a TikTok on what was happening up to that last minute? Yeah, well, that's I mean, that's the big takeaway now is that it did just seem very last minute that there were even negotiations up until the, the day before uh, with Amazon and, and some feelings on the city side and even some of the uh, union representatives that things were uh, looking fairly smooth and they had some sort of agreement on how to meet everyone's concerns and move forward. And that the, the very next day, the phone call came about uh, uh, about the plans to retreat, uh, you know, just maybe an hour or two before before it was publicly announced. All right, well, we're going to continue to follow how this develops and whether Amazon starts to look elsewhere, even though they said they, they won't be. Uh, meantime, in other Amazon news, the company led a $700 million investment in the electric truck maker Rivian. That is now official. Why do you think Amazon wants to be investing in electric trucks, Spencer? Well, it, it's a very, it is a very interesting development, especially given all of their... Uh, logistics ambitions of late and let's just think how how they started delivering packages to doorsteps on their own as opposed to relying on the Postal Service or UPS and FedEx they've got their mobile application uh, that helps people use their own cars to deliver packages kind of like uber then this past summer they announced uh, this kind of call to arms to entrepreneurs saying hey start a business uh, lease some vans hire some people We'll give you a steady stream of business, and and that really quick grew very quickly. And and this year there were thousands of drivers over the holiday season in these new Amazon branded vans making deliveries around around the country, and that's something they continue to recruit for. So if you think how could electric trucks fit into that, uh, could be very very appealing for them, especially if there's uh, you know growing concerns about emissions and and trying to have zero emission vehicles. This could be very strategic long term okay. acquisition for them. Spencer Soper for us there in Seattle. That's a fascinating bet. We'll continue to watch. Coming up, our conversation with monumental sports CEO Ted Leonsis. Why he thinks Fortnite is the perfect communal game next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. While the 20th annual NBA All-Star Technology Summit is underway, exploring unique trends and innovations in sports, media, and technology, Bloomberg's Jason Kelly and Carol Masser sat down with Amy Brooks, Chief Innovation Officer for the NBA, and asked about how social media is playing a role in content creation for the league. Take a listen. We see our games on TV as meals and social media and all of the content as snacks. So our players are out there developing content, our teams are developing content, and we, the league, are developing content. So we have 1.5 billion followers amongst players, teams, and the league. And our job is just to engage fans globally in every way we can in different platforms and testing and learning is a big part of that. Amy, talk to us about the platforms, right? Because you have traditional where you go to a game, you've got men's, you've got women's, you've got esports, you've got streaming. Like, where's the biggest growth potential? What's fun, we think the engaging side of the broadcast has a lot of potential. And our other leagues beside the NBA allow us to test. We have our NBA 2K League, which is yeah. broadcast on Twitch. Our G League is broadcast on Twitch. I'll give you a quick example of what we're doing with the G League. League, we're actually allowing people to vote for the MVP in a G League game, and then at the end of the game, that MVP can came on and take come on and take direct questions oh, from fans. Great. So it allows us to test and learn a lot. But is that where the where's the most growth? Because like we talk about esports a lot, and I think they talk about it being like a billion dollar business by 2020. Where's the biggest growth? 
Well, we see esports as a great way, again, going back to the global opportunity to engage our fans. We see the potential of having an esports team internationally, and that's much harder to do with the, the NBA. So we see that as a fantastic opportunity. I think you were just in China. Talk about mm -hmm. that as an opportunity. What are the challenges? It's obviously a massive market. Everybody has a China strategy. Help distill the NBAs. Yeah, there. we have 300 million people play basketball there. We had 640 million people watch the NBA there. We have these phenomenal partners. It's it, when I was just amazed at just the avidity of people loving basketball. It's the number one team sport there. The challenge, of course, is how far away it is, but we're really focused on how we capture that market in unique and different ways. And they're so forward-looking, so tech-savvy, and so they just love consuming NBA however they can. You know, it was interesting kind of prepping for this. Like, you've got a lot of owners who come out, and I think we are living in such a political, social activist world. How do you balance letting players and owners of teams express their opinions or help kind of balance those situations with also kind of managing a huge industry in a league. Yeah, it's it's important to give players and owners, but especially our players, a, a platform by which they can use their voice and speak out at whatever cause is important to them. We want to make sure we feel they feel supported. Um, obviously, diversity is is a core value of the NBA, and we're, we're, we really want to embrace our players and, and enable them to freely speak. Talk about the WNBA and sort of the opportunities there, how it fits in, where you see the most growth. Yeah, it's it, you know, it's important to me, especially as, as a woman that I work for a league that embraces not just diversity of our players in the NBA, but we have our own that's women's great. professional league, and we see tremendous potential for this. It's it's a league that's been around for over 20 years, but we think that in today's society, it's really prime for capturing a new audience as well for people who care about progressive women and what women are doing, not just on the court but off the court. So when you think about technology, one of the elements that comes to the fore is gambling. It is in a totally different uh, environment now, post the decision last year by the Supreme Court. What's the strategy as it, this sort of starts to set in for the NBA? Yeah, obviously first and foremost is integrity as this comes, but it's happening already we just want to embrace it and make sure it's regulated in the right way. But for us, we see engagement as the opportunity. Data shows that when people bet or do fantasy gaming, they watch for three times as long. So for us, that's a great opportunity to make our game more unique, more engaging for fans. That was Amy Brooks there, NBA Chief Innovation Officer. Sticking with this annual NBA Tech Summit, Bloomberg's Jason Kelly and Carol Masser also caught up with monumental sports CEO Ted Leonsis to talk about everything from the NBA's media platform, tech partnerships, and the potential growth for eSports. Take a listen. The NBA is a platform that's no different than Google or Amazon. We have a big corporate structure of the league. We have multiple apps, NBA, WNBA, G League, uh, NBA 2K, Summer League, and that our data that we generate is um, deeper, uh, more real time than anything that you cover at Bloomberg in business and industry. And so uh, just as your company grew as a platform, it started terminals to a small group and now is a gigantic media company focused on financial services, I believe that the NBA will continue to grow on a global basis. So that didn't happen by accident, right? I mean, you it feels like the NBA is around the corner from other leagues, candidly. You know other sports yeah, as well. it started when I was at America Online. We did the first deal with, uh, I used to call David Stern, Commissioner Stern. Uh, Commissioner.com, <laughs> and, and he really saw it. He started this um, this tech conference. Uh, this tech conference is one of the most important uh, industry events. I mean, it's everyone who's in technology wants to come, and in media, because um, our game, our sport, is the most valuable content, the most valuable data on the whole media landscape, and. It's um, very, very relevant to older people. Like I call this modern nostalgia. I mean, I walked by and I saw Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and it's like <laughs> Kareem. I mean, I grew up 
<laughs> with Kareem, and, and it's very, very relevant to millennials. It's fast-paced, it's real-time, it's lots of data. It's very relevant to the next generation, the Gen Z, who will never get cable, who want to interact with um, entertainment and stars, and we're leaders in esports. Um, I've been make, personally uh, been making huge investments in esports. I own Team Liquid with Peter Gruber, owns the Golden State Warriors. How big is that market going to be? We see numbers of about a billion in 2020. How, how big do you it think? It is going to superset um, all of the leagues in terms of engagement because it started globally. It didn't start in North America or Canada. It's, uh, it's something that started globally. And it's free to get started. I, I made an investment in Epic and mm -hmm and Fortnite, and it's the ultimate, it's the perfect communal game, right? And, and it's kids getting together and playing a game, they survive on, on the island, and they're talking with their friends, and it's become a platform. Did that become bigger than you thought it was? I mean, that has become a juggernaut. Did you anticipate it'd be this big, Fortnite? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. What is Done. it? But what is it about Fortnite? Because I mean, it really has. I think it caught a lot of people off guard. Not you, apparently, but it really came out of nowhere to a lot of people. Well, the the management team, the leadership team of Epic, is um, just down the long, road here, right? Yeah, long yeah. time in that industry, and their founder CEO really has a good touch with the publishers and the studios and understanding what's going on. But what he was able to do was to make an exchange. I will give you for free a real communal piece of software that will activate friendships, activate uh, viewing. I think it's the first, um, first um, multi-user game that was designed that would be easy to follow. Most of we play in League of Legends, there's Overwatch leagues. Yeah. If you haven't played the game, you're new to it, you just yeah. get dropped in front of a television, it's hard to understand what's going on. Fortnite, you can understand, it's bite size, and, and it's building a platform that's global and worldwide. Ted, I see the NBA team owners, teams, um, and the league, you know, developing interesting partnerships, whether it's Intel, other tech companies, whether it's streaming companies. Is that how you do it going forward, or does it lead to more acquisitions of you guys kind of getting closer and closer? Well, I, uh, partnerships are very, very important, and we right now are very focused on giving a lot of value to our media partners. I think gaming and gambling, um, I was head of the, the NBA media committee, chairman of the media committee, and I saw that they wanted our content, but they were very nervous about what the future would hold because it's not so much cutting the cable, it's that young people never will sign up for it. And so, so in this two-screen universe, if you can create an environment where people will get deep into the data and engage before the game, during the game, after the game, be communicating, um, it's really, really good for the media partners, and that'll be really, really good for the league and the owners and, and the players. That was Monumental Sports CEO Ted Leonsis. Coming up, SurveyMonkey reported its fourth quarter results this week. We're going to hear from CEO Xander Laurie on their enterprise strategy and his thoughts on Amazon's retreat from New York. Escape from New York. <laughs> and later in the program, Amazon's proposed expansion in New York. No more. The deal's proponents are very upset. We're going to hear from Congressman Carolyn Maloney about why she is not happy for her constituents. This is Bloomberg. Back to the big story of the week, Amazon canceling its plans for a New York campus. From the beginning, Amazon was criticized for failing to engage with lawmakers and local politicians, keeping most of the process secret. Now the company is being called out for quickly pulling the plug instead of negotiating with the community. But what do other tech leaders think of Amazon's exit? Joining us to discuss, SurveyMonkey CEO Xander Lurie. Do you think Amazon prematurely walked away from a fight here? 
Uh, you know, this is a big story. Amazon's one of the most respected companies in the world, one of the most valuable companies in the world. You know, it was a very celebrated process and a pretty creative one. Amazon would have created about $30 billion of tax revenue for the community. And I think $3 billion of credits maybe got disproportionate share of the blame or attention. Um, we did a survey of over 10,000 people around the end of the year. We found Detroit was the city that wanted Amazon most. Hmm. So over 78% of Detroit residents were looking forward to having Amazon HQ2 there. New York always perplexed me, to yeah. be honest. I mean, I expected them to go to a place that might have needed Amazon more. Yeah, I don't want to make a discreet pitch for SurveyMonkey here, but <laughs> part of it is like these politicians that really got into the fight they better have a really keen sense of what their constituents and their community wants. And I think if you're, if you're collecting data, you're listening to the voices and opinions of the people you're representing, hopefully you have a really good sense when you kind of push Amazon away that that was in the best interest of your community. It would have created a lot of really high paying jobs. And I think Amazon maybe is, they're either negotiating or they're in fact saying this isn't hospitable for us and they're going elsewhere. But Somebody didn't get the sentiment of the community in a good way. Well, we spoke to a number of lawmakers, opposing lawmakers yesterday, including State Senator Michael Giannaris, who was you know, one of the most vehemently opposed to this. And I asked him, is this really a win? Take a listen to what he had to say. I don't think that was worth it. Um, I, and I think the way Amazon reacted to it uh, proved my point, that they were unwilling to deal with uh, legitimate concerns that uh, this community had. They negotiated this deal in secret. Uh, and when it was discovered by the public, the uh, public outrage disturbed them. All we did was raise our hand and say, we have some questions about this deal. So defending his sort of approach there, admitting it's not a celebration that they lost. Yeah. You talk about this all the time, Emily. It highlights big tech is increasingly relevant. We represent a disproportionate share of market cap, hiring, growth, what the media talks about. Amazon, every move they make gets a lot of attention. And so I think there's a lot of backroom negotiations here. Do you do any surveys on the tech lash, um, tech backlash? And should Amazon have known better that maybe they wouldn't be welcomed like heroes? Yeah, we, we are living in a very dynamic times politically. When you look at the administration, issues which are pushing people to the right and to the left, we know that big tech is increasingly scrutinized. People are increasingly sensitive to data that's being shared, uh, to the job losses, to AI, and companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google and others are getting a lot of scrutiny and attention, and there is a place for critics on both sides to have their case made. There are cable networks which really amplify those voices, and this one is obviously a highly dynamic and situation that has probably not had the final chapter written yet. Does Facebook deserve all the scrutiny it's getting? And I ask knowing that Sheryl Sandberg is on your board. <laughs> Yeah, I have no uh, non-public material information about Facebook. I, they have owned up to some mistakes, and I think they're taking appropriate measures to cure them. It sure seems like Facebook has done some incredibly good things in terms of hiring and connecting the world and paying a lot of tax dollars. You know, Cheryl, I do have a proprietary view on. I've been very close to her for a long time, and she's on our board. She is an incredibly high-integrity leader. She has spent so much time and money helping others, mentoring others in philanthropy. I think she and the leadership team there are digging in deep to fix whatever issues there are at Facebook, and I'm confident that company's going to thrive for a long time. So last quick, quick question about your earnings. You reported this week the shares did plunge. They recovered a bit today. What happened there? Yeah, we, uh, we put up a really terrific Q4. I'm super proud of all the employees of SurveyMonkey. 2018 was a transformational year for the company. We, went public in September, but more importantly, we reaccelerated revenue and launched an enterprise product that can fight with the world's best survey software. So we're winning really tough deals from discerning companies. We booked our first $10 million sales quarter and put up 80% year-over-year growth. Shares had a tough day yesterday. It was the first day the lockup comes off. So if last September was the first day you could buy shares, yesterday was the first day that long-term shareholders could sell them. I think if we put up the kind of numbers that, that Wall Street's looking to, our shares will perform just fine over the long term. All right, and you just launched a big integration with Microsoft. Okay, SurveyMonkey CEO Xander Laurie, thank you. Thanks for having me. For stopping by. Coming up. Amazon is no longer expanding into New York, and Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney not happy about what it means for her constituents. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney has been a supporter of the now defunct Amazon expansion deal in New York. She spoke to Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli in Washington about why Amazon ending its plans was not a win for her constituents in New York's 12th district. Well, the fallout today is that my, my constituents who were looking forward to getting these jobs uh, were, are very happy about it, and uh, I'm personally disappointed. I, I feel that if Amazon had come to New York, we would have become the uh, high-tech capital of the East Coast, and that would have been more jobs, more tech workers, more people um, in this industry. One of the challenges of New York, and I've worked with New York leaders for decades on this, is to diversify our economy. We are too dependent on financial services. If there's an economic downturn, it has a whammy on the budget of New York. And along with Mayor Bloomberg and every other mayor and every other elected official and many in the private sector, we would really have meetings and strategies. And we had this competition to bring and build a high-tech school, which was in my district. We beat out all the other uh, competition and had it located, Cornell Tech. It's training. It's a MIT for New York City, training the tech leaders of the future. It, it was a huge investment in tech. And now we had someone who could actually hire the people being trained, and, and now they're leaving. The, the, the fallout is that all of my colleagues in Congress are, are trying to get Amazon to come to their states, yeah. particularly Virginia. I want to, I, well, yeah, and, and the real estate here uh, booming because of that. But I, I want to go back to the central issue of diversification in New York, because you mentioned the financial services sector having obviously deep ties in New York City. But to lure an Amazon to New York, it, it would seem as if it would, it would, it would truly be a, a boom. So what, where was the breakdown from your perspective? What was the specific turning point that turned Amazon away? Well, first of all, I, I would congratulate um, Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo for fighting to win. They went into a competition where it was reported it was roughly 220 locality, city, states, all that wanted Amazon. And New York won. We're the best city in the world. We should have been rejoicing. And you can be for a project while you're working to improve it. I was working with my constituents trying to get some assurances and help and commitment for entry-level jobs, mm -hmm. lower paying jobs. And they were being amenable. They were responding to this. So I think the breakdown is that everybody got in their corner and then they didn't move. It's, it, it, government's always a process. You can work to make it better. I think a, also a huge breakdown was there was a negotiated uh, tax refund of, of $3 billion. And many uh, elected officials and others were portraying it like it was a pot of money that could have gone to schools. Incidentally, Amazon was building a school in Long Island City and pledging 30 other schools to build tech education centers in it. It would have lifted up the educational level uh, and strengthened our school system. So we were working to improve it. If you don't like the deal, then work to improve it. And I think also Amazon had so many other offers. It wasn't like New York was the only place they could go. Uh, Washington State is very happy. They, they hope that they'll expand more there. Virginia is ecstatic. They think they may come there. And my colleagues on the floor, I'd go to the floor and they'd say, hey, Carolyn, we're reading New York doesn't want Amazon. We want them. Mm -hmm. You know, tell us who to call over there or whatever. You know, they, everybody wanted Amazon. And they have a reputation of really helping the communities that they're, they're in. You mentioned about the $3 billion tax refund. And you mentioned about the, the criticism from some within your party, including a freshman congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She and others are in, from your area who are in your party are saying are celebrating this and saying that this is a win for them. Well, uh, my constituents do not feel that way, or yeah. many of them do not feel that way. And, and uh, we, I have to work with them on other things. For example, we're working to get a subway stop in Queens in that neighborhood. They deserve it. We don't even have a firehouse, a full firehouse. We need a firehouse. So we are Tomorrow is another day, and we'll be working together on other projects. They're all talented, but they, the, there was no subsidy. It was a tax rebate from the money that they had paid into the coffers of New York City, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars over a 10-year period. So they pledged 
uh, they pledged 25,000 high paying jobs of over $150,000. So they would not get any type of refund or tax credit unless they created that job. And that job and Amazon had paid really hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in taxes. That was Representative Carolyn Maloney, Democratic Congresswoman with Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli. And that does it from this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're off Monday for President's Day in the United States, but we'll be back on Tuesday. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. We are, of course, live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.